Alright guys, welcome back to another Steam Free to Play walkthrough. Today we have Interactive Horror Stories. I think that's what the game's called. It is what the game is called. It's a choose your own adventure horror game. And I don't know how long these stories are, so we're going to try to play them all at once, but the creator did put that they all have multiple endings. And this song is not from the game. This music's actually from the YouTube audio library. It's called... Something, something... Uh, Apocalypse. That was easy to remember, and I just did because I am awful. But let's read these stories. It should be fun. If they're kind of short, I'll try to get as through as many as I can, but I think I'll only be able to do one poor story because uh, I got work tomorrow. You are a single mother. Your daughter, Lisa, is an intelligent girl who doesn't have any friends. You buy her a rag doll. Soon, Lisa will claim that doll and talk. Well, that sucks. And this is just the beginning of your nightmare. Can the doll be really possessed, as Lisa claims? If you're stuck, you can see our Facebook post about how to get the good ending to the story. Let's play it. Press any key to continue. That one. As a single mother, you know how hard it is to look after a 13-year-old girl. Hard, but still joyful. <laughs> okay, her presence gives you all the strength you need. Her name is Lisa. She is a shy girl. She doesn't talk much. You got diverse divorced three years ago because he cheated on you with his secretary. Lisa misses her father. This is getting sad. This is dark. But you don't allow her to see him. She adores her father, but you think he's an asshole. He sounds like an asshole. But you shouldn't keep it. Well, I don't know. I'm not an adult enough to tackle that situation. Lisa is a special kid. Her teacher once said that she is too intelligent for a girl her age. But you already knew it. Her reactions are unexpectedly mature. She is also hardworking. You expect perfection from her. Her teacher told you, you that you must take Lisa to a psychiatrist. You will do it soon. She is a lonely girl. Maybe because she doesn't talk much. You think that she needs friends. You bought her a rag doll to cease her loneliness. That's gonna keep her from getting friends because now she has a doll to replace them with. You bought the rag doll from the local store, toy store. Not an expensive toy, nothing too fancy. Lisa might still like it. You know that expense doesn't make Lisa happier. The doll is a girl with big blue eyes and curly black hair. She has a wide grin that you can call friendly, terrifying. Her dress is red, matching her shoes. She also has eyebrows. The unnamed doll waits for her new owner in the kid's bedroom. Kid's bedroom. You haven't bought, brought Lisa home from school yet. Okay. It's a Friday, not a sunny day. The sky is covered with gray clouds. You are driving your car. Lisa sits on the next seat. The seat belts are worn tight. She looks from the window blankly without an expression on her face. Face. You remember that the math results were going to be announced today. How are the exam results? Lisa sighs and says, Terrible. I'm in the seventh grade. I'm the seventh in the class. Not first like the previous exam. I know you will be mad at me. I didn't study enough. It's okay, darling. He'll be alright. She looks at you with a slight surprise. You always scolded her when she, whenever she wasn't the best. Now you say it's okay, darling. She closed, continues to watch the cars passing by. What kind of monster am I? You're driven, driving your car, same thing. Were you able to make any friends today? No, she says with a determined voice. They're just idiots. For example, they see the other classes in the school as enemies. As if they were an enemy nation with a different religion. I mean, is it is still silly to be enemies because of race or religion. These morons in my class hate each other just because they are different classes. That's crazy. Why is she talking about race and religion in the seventh grade? I bought you a rag doll today. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. She says there isn't any excitement. Oh. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. She says there isn't any excitement in her voice. Then you're driving, I guess. You finally arrive home. The doll. The doll is in your bedroom, Lisa. You tell her. She climbs up the stairs slowly. Apparently, she isn't excited about the doll. You follow her to her bedroom. She picks up the doll on her bed. I will think of a nice name, but I've got to do homework, homework to do first. Play comes after study. Don't go hard on yourself. So you leave Lisa in her room. You have got a lot of work to do anyway. Not only you will cook, 
but you also need to work on a novel's cover illustration as a freelance artist. The deadline is close, so you work hard and you hard nowadays. You work all day. The only break you take is the dinner. You don't talk about anything during dinner with Lisa. Why not? It's 2200. Bedtime for Lisa. You've, that's 10 p.m. for you for people that don't know the 2400 clock. You visit Lisa before she sleeps. She says she's in her pink dotted pajamas. She is holding the doll in her arms. Mom, I'm going to tell you something, but you won't believe. After a few seconds of silence, she speaks. The doll can speak. She told me her name is Anna. Hmm, go on. Lisa explains. Anna says that she was nothing but a piece of light, a light that's drifting in absolute darkness, a weak light in the infinite darkness. Then she found life in this doll. She was waiting in the toy store for a friend, lonely, and today she found me. She says that she loves me. And what did you tell her? Lisa smiles. And I said that I will be her new friend. And I will always love her. She continues. And then she told me that she was happy. That'd be like the times when she used to be an angel. I believe in you. Keep the doll. It's a good doll. Lisa doesn't show her emotions usually, but this is the time you can see that she is very much surprised. We're gonna get murdered by this fucking doll, but I want my daughter to be happy. <laughs> God. Well, thank you very much, Paul. She says you kiss her goodnight and leave her with the end of the doll. Because of all the hard work, you begin to feel tired and you go to bed. It doesn't take long for you to fall asleep. A few hours later, you wake up to the sounds coming from outside. You hear hysterical laughter coming from the garden. This, they belong to a girl, specifically Lisa's. Lisa, you need to get in the goddamn house. It's like two in the morning. You stand up and look outside the window. You see Lisa, that is creepy, I'm scared. <laughs> you see Lisa standing and laughing in the garden under film moonlight. She is pacing back, you can't see her face. Let's go to the garden. You climb down nervously. You wear your shoes and walk to the garden. Lisa doesn't react to your presence. You reach, approach Lisa and put your hand on her shoulder. She turns her face to you. It is not Lisa's face. It is not a human face. The texture of the face is a gray rag. The eyes are quite big for a human. So is the wide smile. The voice changes. It doesn't belong to a girl now, but a demon. She stares at you and laughs. You wake up. It was just a nightmare. You're all sweaty with terror. The morning has already broken. You decide to check on Lisa. Lisa is sleeping peacefully, hugging Anna. Anna is carrying the, that wild, sm wide smile that annoys you now. But hey, it is normal. You, it would be terrible if the doll's face was different than how you bought it. You go to the kitchen to prepare a weekend breakfast. You usually make a omelet with sausage on Saturdays. You will repeat that habit today. That's such a weird way to phrase it. Oh, I think uh, English isn't the first language. I think it has a different one, but they did pretty good if it's not. You are in the kitchen. You take the sausage and eggs from the fridge. You need to slice the sausage, so you open the kit drawer to pick up the meat knife. Something's wrong. The knife isn't there. That's not good. Why would it be in the garbage bin? Let's check for it. You couldn't find the knife in the garbage bin. You search the knife in everywhere possible, but it's vain. So you decide to use another knife to prepare the omelet. After you prepare the omelet, Lisa wakes up and joins you in the kitchen. You eat the breakfast with her. She doesn't look so happy. The meat knife is missing. It's strange, Mom. I have no idea where the knife went. Lisa answered. You eat the breakfast. Did Anna speak again? She did not speak today. But she kept changing her facial expression. Sometimes she looked so happy, sometimes not. She was frowning. There was anger in her face. I can't understand her. Lisa continues eating the breakfast. I don't want to tell her to study today, no play. Breakfast is over. I need to study math, asks, says Lisa, then climbs up to her room. You also need to work on the novel cover. You're both busy right now. It is evening now. As you work on the cover, you hear the screams from Lisa's room. You rush to her in panic. You find Lisa standing and breathing in panic. Her arms are full of stitches. She did it. 
Lisa screams, showing her heavily wounded arms. I'm gonna beat this bitch's ass. She hit. Oh, I'm gonna kill this fucking doll. She jumped right away. Lisa points to the open window. I'm gonna beat this bitch's ass. You look outside, you can't see any running dolls. Maybe because she ran away, or it's too dark side, or Lisa. I will allow her to harm you, Lisa. I'm gonna beat that bitch's ass. You crouch and hug Lisa, and she, now she cries. I know how hard it, I know how hard it is to believe me now. Thank you for believing me, but please, I want to stay alone. I know she won't, that she won't come back. No. So you let her stay alone. What? After closing the windows and locking the door, you make sure that no doll can trespass. What about the window? You can get into her, your own bedroom next to Lisa's room so you can hear her in case she needs you. It is... This isn't Lisa. I'm gonna beat this fucking doll's ass. I'm gonna beat this doll. I'm getting mad. <laughs> I'm gonna kill this doll. It is 3 o'clock in, in the morning now. It's raining outside, lightning strike, and the light in your dark bedroom. You haven't slept. You don't care about the freelance work you got. All these events make you too stressed to care about business. You see Lisa's silhouette at the door. She walks in. Lisa turns on the light and approaches you. Mom, I need to confess something. The doll was not possessed or anything. I made it up. I really need to get psychiatric help. I feel a huge urge to murder you. Please help me. You hug her. You ha had done parenting failures before. But it's not too late to fix them and your mentally ill daughter. The end. There are two possible endings. Was that the right ending? What's the bad ending? Let's play and try to get the bad ending. I think that was a good ending. I think I did get the good ending. Let's see what happened. So a lot of this doesn't change, but there's a good ending and a bad ending. You slapped your daughter so hard she hits the floor. Get out of here, Lisa. Mm. <laughs> you don't visit Lisa that night. Ah, Lisa's holding something behind her back, but you can't see it. She approaches your bed, climbs it, and comes near you. Whoa! <laughs> With a sudden move, she stabs the meat knife in your belly. You never trusted me! She stabs you once again. You didn't allow me to live my childhood! She keeps stabbing you bloody with body with insanity. I hate you, Mom! I hate you! These are the final words you hear as your daughter, own daughter repeatedly stabs you and commits matricide. Oh, I got the good ending though, the first time. Good job, me. The funeral. These are pretty short. After funeral is a modern gothic horror that takes place. Why is all my, why are all the kids, why are you targeting kids? <laughs> After your son's burial, you receive messages in your computer that is claimed to be sent by your son's soul. He says that he wants to be with you once again, and he will ask you to do things. Will you believe the message? Oh, that's not even cool. You used to be a father. This is sad. It has been three days since your son, Jonathan White, was buried in the graveyard of the local church. He was eight, eight years old. He had golden hair and blue eyes, just like the beloved man in the carpenter song, close to you. Since your wife passed away after giving birth to Jonathan, and now, and since he has been your everything, he was your angel, now he is gone. He died on, a, died on a snowy winter morning. You had gone to the market, leaving him at, alone at home. When you arrived at home, you found Jonathan lying on the bed motionless. His face was covered with his pillow choked. Police couldn't find any trace of trespassing. You clearly remember the moments of solemn moments of Jonathan's funeral. In fact, you tried to forget, but the details are in the front of your eyes and they won't go away. The priest had intoned psalms and prayers, those you are not fami so familiar with. You are not so religious. While the lifeless body of your son laid in the church, his feet were turned to the east. He was wearing black suits and shiny shoes. His skin was pale. He was way too young for all this. Way too young. That's awful. 
He wished it was you laying there instead of him. Like the day Jonathan died, it's a snowy day in all of Ohio. There are three inches of snow outside. It's 1400 now, 2 p.m. You are a writer who has been on a writer's block since the, that day. Your favorite word processor is open in the computer. Green is blank. You haven't written anything for a long time. There are cigarette buds in the ashtray in your black hot coffee and a blue cup on your work table. You chain smoke and consume a lot of coffees coffee nowadays. As you're sipping your coffee, the doorbell rings. Uh, might as well open it. You open the door. It's Bob, your neighborhood friend. You had drunk beers and had barbecue with him for several times. Bob is a nice guy. He is overweight, has short black hair, and has no facial hair. He wears a dark blue jacket and a black beanie. Hey, how are you? I wanted to ask how you've been. I'm still depressed, bro. Bob replies, Ah, uh -huh. I can imagine how hard it is. I've never had kids, but I had a cat when I was... What is wrong with you? I loved her as my daughter, then I had to bury her. Well, that's sad too. Her to the garden myself. It was tough. I know how much you love Jonathan. I am shocked like you to see him gone. Bob continues. I'm not trying to hear about your cat, dude. I know that's sad, but damn. I am going to the market right now. Do you need anything? You remember that trial of cigarettes? Yeah, I could use some cigarettes, bro. Oh, you need cigarettes? He puts his hands in his pocket and pulls out a pack of cigarettes. Maybe I'm a bad friend for doing this, but anyway, let's take this. I'll buy myself another pack in the market. You take the pack that has 10 cigarettes since I am thinking. Okay, man, see you later. You say goodbye to Bob, too. When he goes, you close the door and sit back on your work table. You look at the computer screen that should have been blank, but no, it is not blank. Something is written. Daddy, I missed you. After you shout your deceased son's name out, new letters appear in form of reply. Yes, it is me. You are a not a computer engineer, but you know that it is possible to hack someone's computer and put a prank on him if the computer is online. Your computer is connected to the Crouch down and frantically pull the ethernet cable from your computer. You expect that nothing else will be written, but no, you are wrong. I am in the computer. How is that possible, Jonathan? Good Lord said that I should be together with you. He said that I love you and he lo and you love me, so he sent me back. Oh? I'm so afraid, Daddy. It is cold and dark. I'm so cold in here. Please bring me back. You want to see me once again? Yes. Find five cattles and wait for the midnight. Bye for now, Daddy. You have I only one candle at home. You normally use the candle when the electricity is gone, so you don't need more than one candle before. What will you do? Well, buy some candles. So you wear your long beige coat and black leather boots and walk to the market to buy four candles and you return home. At home you wait in front of the, your monitor. Nothing happens till midnight. Then a message appears on the screen. I'm back, Daddy. Did you bring the candles? Yeah. Good. Let me explain how you can bring me back. Go to the cemetery, dig my grave, bring my coffin home. What? Uh, okay. We shall speak again once you bring my coffin. You know it is the same what you do, but you get prepared to go outside. You wear your coat and get it outside your home. It's snowing like hell, a cold interpretation of hell. Outside, the sky has a bright purple color. Illuminating the night with the help of a full moon behind the clouds. You get in your car and start it. The streets and roads are empty. There's only you outside in this hour of the night. It doesn't take long to arrive in the church and its graveyard. The graveyard is covered with snow and gray mist. No lights come from the church. Either there is nobody inside or the priest is sleeping. That's good. You can't be seen while digging your son's grave. You find the graves of your son and wife. Wife, Jonathan White was buried next to his mother. There is an unoccupied area next to them. You will be buried there when your time comes. You search for a shovel. You find it in about ten minutes. You're ready to dig the grave. Dig the grave. You start digging Jonathan's grave. After six feet of digging, you reach the little wooden coffin. You climb down and carry the coffin up. After that, you climb up and carry the dirty coffin to your car's back seat. You had never done some, any, something this bizarre before. 
But we're trying to save our son, Jesus Christ. Well, I know this is probably futile. You're not supposed to bring the dead back, but after you reach home, you get off your car and carry the coffin home. Luckily, there's nobody around. Drag the coffin to your living room center. You don't care about the floor getting dirty with soil. Thank you, Daddy. Gets written on the screen. I'll put the candles right on my coffin like a star. This is like demon summoning, but it's worth a try. Carefully place the candles around the coffin, making it the center of the star. You light them with your lighter. Now read these aloud, Daddy. A lonely goat on a mountain. He is thirsty. Thirsty for humanly love and affection. I shall give him the water. Oh, now this is a demon. We're summoning a Satan. This is a bad idea. You read the lines. A lonely goat on a mountain. He is thirsty. Thirsty for humanly love and affection. I shall give him the water. And the coffin starts to shake. The coffin's lid gets open slowly. You see Jonathan opening the lid and rising up. His skin is pale, almost white. You can smell the rot of his undead corpse. He is wearing that black suit you couldn't forget. He stands on his coffin feet and smiles at you. Then he steps outside the coffin and away from you without saying anything. And he does something you wouldn't expect from the dead. He dances, he dances with joy. After a half minute, he stops dancing, stares at you. His eyes are still blue. Take me in your arms, Daddy. Take me to the bathroom. I want to show you something. It is impossible. This is terrifying. It is impossible not to obey what... This is scary. What he says. <laughs> you feel his dominating presence. His presence is dominating the room, overwhelming you, and it's impossible to say no. You crouch down and take him into your arms. You carry him into the bathroom. You bring him to the dark bathroom. You turn on the light and get horrified by what you see in the mirror. The boy's reflection is different. His skin is burnt like coal. Jonathan had an innocent, innocent and handsome face. But the face you see is far from being pleasant. It's like a really old man's face who is also very ugly and he has no hair. I always wanted a daddy like you, says the eldritch abomination you hold in your arms. The end. Alright, let's play it again. Damn. Summoned the freaking Cthulhu monster. You turn off the computer and the monitor screen goes black then nothing else appears on the screen you don't find anything to write in your novel so you don't need to turn on the computer again and yes also the text disturbed you you don't experience anything supernatural during the rest of the day and now you take your sleeping pills and fall asleep you have a you're you are having a vivid dream you see jonathan in a garden with green glass and colorful flowers he runs around with the happiness and angels there are white dressed Angels around him. Everyone is smiling. You are not part of this dream. Jonathan doesn't see you, but you are still content with him, with seeing him happy in Eden. He was always a benevolent boy after all. He deserved to go to heaven. You wake up at the sound of the door, door rings bell. You take a look at the clock. It's 10 a.m. You wake up, you wear your slippers and open the door. It's Bob. Hello, I need to show you something. He holds a newspaper in his hand. There is anxiety on his face. You take the newspaper. It's Ohio's local newspaper. Another kid choked to death. Officers are investigating the curious case of repeated deaths of kids in the state. Yesterday night, a six-year-old boy, Kevin Madsen, was found dead in his bed by his parents. His face was covered by a pill. I'm gonna kill this dude. What makes this interesting for officers is this is the seventh time a boy died this way in the month of Ohio this month in Ohio. Recently, eight-year-old Jonathan White also died with a pillow on his face. Sheriff Walcott states that he finds the recent events quite interesting. Interesting, dude? It's not interesting. It's fucked up. Well, I guess we got two endings. But what? There are only two possible endings? Didn't there be another one where I find the killer and I murder him? Oh, that sucked. Chris Skull. You are a king who is loved by his people. You have a serious problem though. Your only child, Juliana, has an incurable disease and she is dying. You hear about a crystal skull which can cure people's illnesses and let people have visions. It is brought to your palace from the continent of America, but the man warns you that the skull might be cursed. Uh, well, we gotta try to save her if we can. Being a king is hard. Being a good king is even harder. You know this well as the sole ruler of the European Kingdom in the age where, when America is discovered. 
It has been 25 years since you ascended the throne. Your subjects are content with your role. Your country is peace, you're in peace and the people are wealthy, but there's something wrong with your life. Your daughter, Juliana, is ill. She is only 18 years old and she has got an illness that nobody could cure yet. Princess is dying and she is your only child and heir to the throne. Every doctor you could find tried to cure her. They tried almost everything, almost. You have been informed about a miraculous artifact. Unearthed in the continent of America, it is a human skull made of crystal. It amazes the scholars because no method is known to carve up such an excellent shape of a skull out of a crystal. These, this skull doesn't belong to the world that you know, but to an ancient civilization that has been lost. But what amazes the scholars is not just the impossible creation. The skull is told to bring miracles to whom touches it with their bare hands. Some people tell that the, they saw visions from the future. Some tell that they saw how the human race has human race has originated. And some tell that the skull can cure their illnesses. Those couldn't be cured with the medications available to your era. Naturally, you ordered your best man to bring the miraculous skull to the palace. It's midnight now. You're you are in Juliana's chamber. She's lying in bed. Holding your hand as you sit by her bed. No candles are lit inside. Full moon enlightens the princess's chamber, shining on her long blonde hair and blue eyes. She is weak, too weak. Her skin is pale. She has under her under eye bags. Uh, showing her illness, you already suffered the loss of your wife 10 years ago. Now you can't stand seeing your only daughter slowly die. Jolion asks you with a soft voice. Father, am I going to die? Eventually, yes. Besides, it is so sad. I am a princess with ambitions, ambitious to become a ruler. And it is sort certainly not about personal gain. I want to continue what you do. I want to be a fair ruler and make your people happy. He continues, but I think this is life. Death conquers all. The door of the chamber is knocked on. The oh, servants generally don't disturb the royal family members at night, so it must be important, something important. Come in! Brunab boy, one of your servants, gets inside the chamber with politeness. He looks at you and says, Your Majesty, the artifact has been brought. You had been waiting for this moment for a long time. Kiss Juliana's forehead, I will come back. After you kiss Juliana's forehead and say, I will come back, she brings your head to her pair of lips and kiss it. Then you leave Juliana alone in her chamber. At the exit of Juliana's chamber, you see Sir William, one of the nice, those were appointed with the task of bringing the ancient skull. He is a strong man with black hair and a round beard. He wears his gloves and holds a bag. Your majesty, he says and kneels before you. Signal him to stand up. Let's go to my study chamber. Sir William follows you as you walk to your study. The chamber is well lit with silver candelabrums. All the furniture are classy. It is a king's study room after all. There's only one chair. It is for you. You sit on it. <laughs> Sir William stands by you and pull, slowly pulls the artifact from his bag. You push the books on the study desk to open space for the artifact. Excuse me. Here it is, he says, and gently puts the skull on the study desk. The skull is truly a masterpiece. It is crafted by humans. All the details of a human skull are printed with care on raw crystal. Lights are coming from the candles. Lights coming from the candles are refracted inside the crystal, gaining various colors of the rainbow. It's magnificent but you sense something sinister, something that doesn't belong to our world. Did you knights touch the skull? Yes, we did touch the skull with our bare hands and we all had visions. We took glances from our futures. Some of us saw how they will die. Some of us saw our grandchildren. He continues, but maybe we shouldn't have touched the skull. The day we were about to leave, a native man came to us. He looked like the chief of his tribes. He knew little of our language, but he shouted some words that we could not understand. There's no touch. So we haven't touched the skull with our bare hands again. 
I know that our princess needs to find a cure. I know also know that we've received inf reliable information about the magical powers of this skull when it comes to incurable diseases. But your majesty, I have got a very bad feeling about this skull. I believe the wisest decision is to throw this skull into the sea. I trust your insight. Let's do it. I'm glad to, that you agree, your majesty. So he packs the crystal skull back into your bag, the bag, you to get outside the palace and get on with your horses, ride to the docks. When you reach the docks, Sir William finds stones and fills the bag with it. Then he throws the bag, your only hope for curing Juliana's shit. In the bottom of the dark sea, I know how hard it will be, but maybe this is the best for all of us. You hope that he is right. The end. There are three endings in this one. Okay. Oh, this isn't right. That. Touch the skull. You're about to touch the skull, so William holds your hand and prevents you from touching the skull. Your Majesty, I think that I need to tell you something about the skull before you touch it. First, no touch again. I can't let Juliana die. She will touch the skull. The knife sighs. As you wish, Your Majesty, but if you are going to bring the skull to her, I wish you would wear gloves. Touch with my bare hands. You ignore the knife, touch the skull with your bare hands, and instantly find yourself in a vision. In your vision, you are in the middle of a ritual. There are about 100 naked humans around you, forming a circle whose center is you. They're all prostrating themselves, worshiping you. It's nighttime. The plain area is enlightened with torches and stars. You see a step pyramid nearby. It is made of huge stone blocks. You realize that you are the crystal skull. You can't see yourself, but you, can com you are completely aware of what you are. Those naked people are worship you, the crystal skull. Then the vision changes. Now it is not night, morning. It is raining like hell. There is a huge flood. Unclothed, red-skinned humans scream and get drowned by, get drowned because of the <laughs> disastrous torrent. And you, as the skull, drift away. You open your eyes and turn back to who you really are, the good king. Sir William looks at you. Tell the vision. Tell him what you've seen in your vision. Yes. Gosh, the skull is mysterious. I can't understand it. I hope it doesn't bring harm to you or your princess. Let me bring the skull to Juliana. You thank Sir William for his services and let him go. You carry the skull to the Juliana's chamber. You enter her chamber and see that she hasn't slept yet. She rises up and she sits on her bed. She looks at the skull in awe. You... It looks marvelous and scary, she says. You approach Juliana and let her touch the skull. He holds the skull, rubs her hands around it, and nothing happens. Is something supposed to happen? She asks and gives the skull back. Then she continues, Let's wait for tomorrow morning. Maybe it'll, it shows its effect then. So you decide to leave Juliana alone. Let her sleep in the... The skull will st be studying... Staying in the study chamber. After this time day, you go to your chamber. There are no guards at the door. You just trust everybody in, everybody in the palace. You are a love king. The furniture are luxurious in the chamber too. You take a glance at yourself and your reflection in the mirror. You say on myself, you take pride in how you look. You are a middle-aged man, but you still look handsome as though you were young. Your looks are an important factor that makes you a charismatic leader besides being fair and wise. Damn, I'm really into myself. You wear your mic gown and get in your bed. It is a bed for two people, but you haven't slept with anyone since your wife passed away. You have a secret that you keep from everyone. Sometimes you hug the second pillow on your bed as if it was someone you love. You do this since ch your childhood. Nobody needs to know it. Yeah, nobody needs to know that. It doesn't take long for you to fall asleep. You wake up in the morning, something's wrong. You can't move your arms. No, not only your arms. You can't move a part, any part of your body. You are paralyzed. And suddenly your body starts to move involuntarily. It stands up without your consent. You feet bring you to the mirror. You see your face in the mirror. You are terrified, but there is a grin on your face. You are no longer in control of your body. You are merely a bystander of what it does. It brings you to the throne room with confident steps. Soldiers salute you. To be exact, it. As you enter, it sits on the throne and shouts with your voice. Bring me my daughter! You watch guards accompany. 
Doyana, as she comes into your presence, is shouts, I don't want her to suffer anymore. Kill her. Doyana is shocked. What? Father, please. She is not the only one surprised one in the room. Everybody looks at each other with shock. It shouts, You heard your king kill her. You try to shout, but your screams are buried inside the head of the king. Juliana gets on her knees and cries in despair, but it's in vain. Two black masked decapitators come into your presence. One holds a crying blind girl, the other holds a sword. Ooh, you can do nothing but watch as your precious daughter gets decapitated. Her head falls down and rolls to the stone. Um, the floor gets filled with blood. Days pass and continues to control your body. You mourn for your daughter inside the body that once belonged to you. You watch it rule your country with an iron fist. It, uh, it orders all churches to be burnt and priests to hang. Of course, your people uprises against the new king. It suppresses a revolt with violence. Anyone who stood against the king is tortured. Eyes are poked, skins are flayed. Soon, it orders people to worship it as a deity. The god king declares war against other countries. It doesn't take long for the other countries to form an alliance against the god king. In a faithful battle in your capital, the god king loses his horse. The evil king gets killed while desperately searching for a horse. Oh, that's that uh, one story. My kingdom for a horse. I can't remember what that is, but I know that's a thing. And this is how your soul finally breaks free to heaven to see your family once again. Well, I guess I got to go to heaven at the end, but damn, that sucked. I literally killed my daughter. Get the last inning. You look for your gloves around the study chamber. Sir William pulls his own gloves off. I think you wish Juliana to touch the skull as soon as possible. Let's not wait for the service. Find your gloves, he says, and gives you them. You wear the gloves and hold the crystal skull with your covered hands. Let me bring the skull to Juliana. You think? Yeah, we've already seen that part. Juliana touches the skull. She closes her eye and doesn't react to anything in the external world. You understand that she is having a vision. After 10 seconds, she opens her eyes with a gasp. I saw things. I don't know how to describe them. They were pitch black creatures so ugly. Their eyes, they were red as flames and they all stared at me. She starts to cry. Please keep the thing, this thing away from me. Please. And I want to be alone. So she, you decide to keep the skull in your study room and let your daughter sleep. After this tiring day, you... Go to your chamber. There are no guards at the point. Let's examine myself. Oh, same thing. Wear your night gal. It doesn't take long for you to fall asleep. Father? You wake up to Juliana's voice. She gently holds your shoulder. I'm about to get stabbed. You look at her. She has a happy smile on her face. Her skin is not pale, but saturated with life. She no longer has bags on her eyes. I feel wonderful. She takes a few steps back and starts dancing. You laugh with happiness. Stand up and hug her. Juliana walks in the quarters of the palace, dancing and laughing. You and the pe people of the palace are very happy to see her this way. She used to be like a ghost before. You plan a feast and invite all the lords of the kingdom. A few days later, every lord arrives to the capital city to celebrate the health of the princess. After the feast, Juliana is the center of everybody's attention. She talks with everyone joyfully, makes, ev makes jokes, makes people laugh. With the the feast is over and it's midnight. Everybody goes to the chambers reserved for them. You accompany Juliana to her chamber. Put a kiss on her forehead before letting her sleep. Then you go to your own chamber and fall asleep in peace. You wake up to the sound of knocking on your chamber's door. It's still night. You wonder who dared to wake you up at this hour. Uh, ignore? You can't sleep. You feel something is wrong. So wrong. The door of your chamber opens. There's only one person. Oh crap. Oh. Who is allowed to enter without knocking on the king's door, so you understand that it's Juliana who entered. Like you guessed, you see your daughter's silhouette. She closes the door and approaches you with a smile on her face. Juliana! She leans down to you, gently pulls the other pillow that you don't use. Juliana! Oh, Juliana's dead! She says, push the pillow on your face. You struggle, but whoever or whatever is trying to kill you is too strong. The king is dead! Long live the king! He shouts. Why is your own daughter committing patricide, regicide, and referring to herself as king rather than queen? This doesn't make sense at all. That is the end of your reign and life. 
The end. We got all three endings. Nice. Evil beneath the ground. I need to get a drink. This is a lot of reading. My dog is parched. I'm parched. Parched boy. These stories are pretty interesting, though. Evil beneath the ground. We'll be so tired tomorrow, but it might be worth it. I'm having fun. You're a goth university with no friends. Oh, damn it. <laughs> you joined a school trip. I went from a king to a goth university student with no friends. <sighs> to a lake in the forest near it. You decide to wander in the forest at night. You will find bare footprints. Those are coming from a black hole with a ladder. Will you descend that? Fuck no. Evil beneath the ground. I just feel like it's a little bit predictable, some of these <laughs> stories. You are a young university student who identifies as a goth. You are a lonely person. People think that you want to be alone. But in fact, you couldn't find somebody you felt affinity. Everyone is so distant from you. Nobody but you know listens to the music you love. Like Bahas, This Mortal Coil, The Sisters of Mercy, etc. I don't know any of those fans. You heard about a university field trip to a lake and the forest around it in autumn. There would be a picnic. Also, alcohol is permitted. You can. What kind of school trip is this? You could bring your own drinks. You joined the field trip. Not only maybe you could make some new friends, but you could also love the nature, especially when it's cold season. This is the word. This English is not as good as the other English. But of course, you couldn't make new friends once again. During the two hours of the bus travel, you found out that every other student who joined the trip were already friends. They simply ignored you. You also didn't approach them. As a result, all you could do was during the bu bus trip was looking outside the window or play games on your phone. While you listen to their joyful laughters, you have mixed feelings about this picnic by the lake. You can't feel yourself as a part of the joyful youth, the youth who are enjoying the nature trip. After having a picnic barbecue, they play a game played a game with the ball in which they formed a circle and tried not to let the ball touch the ground. Everyone participated in the game except for you. But you enjoyed the nature trip somehow. As said before, you loved the nature. You took pictures of the lake with the phone. You don't plan to post the pictures anywhere though. And there is a huge forest near the picnic area. You have always found peace in the green of the forest. After the sun sets, people began to light a campfire and drink. People around your age generally prefer beer, but you don't like it. You feel it overfills your stomach and not causes nausea after two cans. Said you prefer stronger drinks. Today you bought a bottle of red wine and a wine glass. They gathered around the campfire while you drank your wine alone away from them. A handsome guy brought his guitar from the bus and began playing it around the fire. While you have finished your second glass of wine, campfire and illuminate and moon illuminate the darkness. Sun is already set. There are about five hours before the picnic to end. You will be going back to the city with buses. He is playing a calming song. You might join the group. But you also feel a strong urge to have a walk in the dark. Join the group. Why not? You approach the group. Two girls notice you. They open a space for you to sit between them. One is of them is a blonde, the other has long black hair. They wear colorful outfits, contrasting with their, your black outfit. They seem friendly. How are you? My girl says, we are fine. They neither say anything else nor ask how you are. What are your names? The one with, what? I'm a, am I not a girl or am I a dude? The one with black hair says, we have boyfriends. I ask your names. You are trying so hard, aren't you? These people are dumb. I'll just leave. You can stay with the other students. I'll stay. Nothing interesting happens the rest of the day. You finish your bottle of wine and can't make any friends as usual. When the day comes, you get on the bus and go back to the city. Yes, it's a lame ending, but at least you are alive and human. Oh, this one has three endings. Alright. Stand up and walk under away from the picnic. You feel the call of the dark forest, so you walk along the path into the forest. The trees are high and still green. Maybe they stay green in all seasons. You don't know your field is you don't know your field is not biology. 
The soil is wet and muddy. It must have rained before your group arrived at the lake. You leave boot prints on the soil as you walk. There are no clouds in the sky. Full moons and stars illuminate the full the forest, but that's not enough for your eyes. You turn on the flashlight of your phone. There's an app for it too. Nice. Excuse me. You can't clearly see, but notice rabbits in the distance. Naturally, they run from you as they notice your presence. You begin to think that you might have gone too far away from the picnic, but there is nothing interesting in that picnic area. You somehow feel like the darkness of this forest is your only friend. Continue on the path then. You can continue on the forest path. After a few moments, you notice footprints on the soil. They seem to belong to a human with big, bare big feet. Probably a man. The prints cross the path. All of them. You follow the footprints on the soil. They keep changing directions. You find yourself at an elevation. The footprints stop there. Whoever was walking, he didn't leave footprints. Those you could follow anymore. He might have gone anywhere as he didn't follow a single direction. Balls were out back then. You decide to go back to the place where he comes from. After a long walk, you find yourself at a hole. There's a lid and a long rope near it. The man clearly comes from the hole. His footprints prove it. When you hold your bones light into the black hole, you can see that there is a ladder inside the hole. You can't see the end of your hole, end of the hole from your position as a curious drunk and drunk boy, you feel a strong urge to descend. Alright, descend. As you need to use your both hands to climb down, you put your phone into your jeans pockets, turning off the light, you start climbing down. After a few seconds, moon and stars both no longer illuminate what you see. You are in pitch black and the ladder still continues. Finally, you feet touch on the ground. You are so distant from the forest that you can't see the entrance of the hole from where you are. Carefully get on your two feet and you can see nothing yet. Turn on the phone light. The place where you are is a, made of concrete. There is a long corridor in front of you. It is narrow, about a meter wide. It is not very high. There are only a few centimeters between your head and the ceiling of the corridor. You smell a terrible odor. It's the mixture of feces and something you can't understand. There are three doorless holes along the concrete corridor, making three rooms to discover. Examine the first room. There's an empty wooden coffin. A mirror hangs on the concrete wall. A bloody razor and a black whip stand in front of the mirror. In the mirror, you see a reflection and the terror on your face. Okay. You are shocked to find a chained woman in this room. The chain is tied on her ankle. She looks in her 40s too weak. Her bones are noticeable and she has pale skin with a lot of scars. She is on her knees. She is naked. Her body is lightly hairy except for her pubic area. It is quite hairy. Ugh. Contrasting her hairy body, her head is shaved. She stinks not only the smell of feces, but it looks like she hasn't washed for years. She screams at you. Point the light on her. Now let's try to save her. Crouch down to her tied foot. There is no way to remove the. You also notice the pinky toe. Try to find the key. You try to leave the room, but something you don't understand happens. As you exit, you are hit. You are hit something that wasn't visible in front of you. Yes, you saw nothing in front of you. You, you guys, you hit something. You fall onto the floor, and an invisible force carries you and repeatedly smashes your head into the wall. You hear the woman screaming as she, as you black out. She beat me to death. When you wake up, you find yourself lying on the concrete floor in the pitch darkness. By the smell, you can understand that you are in the same place. Whoever is keeping you captive, he stripped you from all the clothes. You're naked and cold. There's a gag on your mouth so you can't shout and communicate with the woman. She might be gagged too. Stand up and try to walk away, but your ankle is tied with a chain. You can walk only in a chamber but one meter radius. Your foot touches a metal bucket, probably where he expects you to defecate. You lose your sense, all sense of time here. You wait for an immeasurable amount of time for something to happen. You are thirsty and hungry. Sometimes you hear your phone ring. It is in a different room. The piano melody is It's Fear by Within Temptation, an ironic name for your situation. They probably notice that you are missing and try to reach you, especially your parents. They must have become mad. Of course you can't answer the call. Finally you hear footsteps. You can you hear your captor coming to your room. 
you're unable to see anything. He takes your gag off. Apparently, he has no problem with seeing in the pitch black. And you hear his voice. Break. It belongs to an old man. A dominant ordering voice. You feel the tip of a bucket on your lip. Who are you? I am your new master. You better behave well. You are mine now. Now drink or I won't give it you or I won't give you it once again. It is water that he's offering. You drink it. Not the best water you drink. It could be taken from the lake, but you have no choice. Other choice, it seems. After you drink enough, he puts a bucket on the ground. Now he brings something else into your lips. Eat. You are too hungry to refuse him. You allow him to put the thing in your mouth that's meat but raw. Ugh. You could, would never eat raw meat except for sushi. Now you chew it slowly. It is rabbit. He says, you swallow the meat despite how it disgusts you. After you eat all he gives you, he puts a gag in, on your mouth and leaves the room without saying another word. After a while, he stands back as you were lying on the floor. Stand up, he orders you. You get on your two feet, he grabs your head body and you feel two sharp fangs on your neck. He starts draining your blood and you understand the true nature of your captor. The vampire, you have no idea how long you have been a prisoner here. You are mostly alone in the room, doing nothing with a gag in your mouth. He occasionally comes back to feed you and himself. Sometimes you hear loud sounds from the other room. He tortures the woman, she screams and begs him to stop, but he doesn't. You hear a whoop hit the naked woman, naked flesh of the woman, but for some reason he doesn't harm you, only the woman. You haven't seen anything for a long time, you have no idea what he looks like. Sometimes you hear sobbing, but it doesn't belong to the woman, to the captor. He cries loudly for some reason. Oh, it looks like we made friends. Some day or night, you can't figure it out. He shows up and takes your gag off. I have done research about you, learned everything about you, he says. Your name shocking you. We have some common points. We both like the dark. We are both outcasts, lonely souls, and we're in darkness. I'll make you an offer, only one, so make your decision wisely. I can make you an immortal like me. You will no longer be in chains. You will have a life, or unlife, in the dark, like you have always wanted. Or you can stay as a mortal and wait for the day you die here as my prisoner. I want to be an immortal, fuck it. Very well, he says. Stand up. You stand up and allow your master to embrace you, and you feel his fangs on your neck once again. This time he doesn't stop. You feel your whole blood is getting drained. Soon you lose consciousness. Any key to continue. You open your eyes. You find yourself lying in a wooden coffin, but this time you are unable to see. There isn't a single light source in this concrete room, but you see your environment as if you are wearing night vision goggles. You're wearing your old clothes and also gloves, so you can't see your skin. You have lost your hair. It has shed. Your old hair is on the coffin's part where you put your head on. You feel your face change too, but it's not, but the most significant, significant change is not, is an unbearable thirst, but not for water. Welcome to a new start, my child. You hear his voice. You look around the room, but you can't see him. There are two coffins and a mirror in the room. You think that our kind can't be seen on the mirror? False, take a look at yourself. Step outside the coffin and walk to the mirror. You are in terror with what you see in the mirror. You don't carry a human face anymore. Your skin has scales like a snake. Its color is light gray, almost white. Your ears are long and have pointy tips. Your eyes are all red. You slowly open your mouth to see your sharp teeth. You scream, break down, and cry in despair. Then you feel his head, claw to be exact, on your shoulder. He stands on your back. Now you are able to see his hand. It is scaled like your skin. Look at me. He orders you. For some reason, you can't disobey your master. You all involuntarily look at the mirror to see the immortal entity behind you. His body is tall, naked, and he has a humpback. His skin is almost white and scaled, but his face is the ugliest thing you have ever seen. The embodiment of evil is torture, murder, rape, and envy. Envy for everything that is pretty and fair. I will teach you everything I know. You're new. And only now, parent says with a hideous smile. The ending. I have Let's get the other ending. There's a Chris Skull too? Did they just put that in? I didn't see that earlier. What the heck? Maybe if you get all the endings, you get more stories. That's kind of cool. No, I didn't mean to do that. Oh, crap. Back.
What's the third room? See a chain tied to the room. It has a bracelet on its end. There are two metal buckets. They are both empty. You know there's a metal key on the floor. Take the key. Crouch down to her tied foot. The key you got, you unlock her bracelet. She is free. You will also notice that her pinky toe is missing. Run with her. Let's get the fuck out of here. You hold the woman's hand and rush to the ladder. Your other hand holds your phone so that you enlighten the quarter. But as you reach the ladders, you feel something hits you in your stomach. You can, can't understand it. You saw nothing in front of you, but there is still there is something. Your phone falls to the ground. You can't see anything. The woman screams, Oh no, he came! You feel something grabs you. Damn it. Well, I tried to save her. Well, we're back here again. Tried to save you, lady. Uh. I guess I gotta stand up. Okay, this time I say no to him. I wanna stay human. Suddenly you feel sharp pain on your shoulders. You hear the loud sound of a whip. He whips you continuously, feeling zero empathy for the agony you feel on your bare skin. You could have been a predator like me. You choose to be a fuck toy. You are a mind torment. You understand, idiot? He shouts at you. He kicks you and leaves you sobbing on the floor. You can do nothing but hope that sweet death will come soon, but it never comes. Oh, well, we got all three endings. Oh. Crystal Skull too. What's up with the king boy now? This time you are not a king. God dang it. I'm never the king anymore. But a libertine billionaire in the modern age. Historical artifacts are one of your vices. Who am I, Dan Aykroyd? Lord. A marvelous Crystal Skull is <laughs> brought to your mansion. And the interesting part is you can hear the voice of Skull in your mind. You can talk to it. But it says... It will bring you joys no mortal can ever reach, but it demands something first. I'd rather not. Consider yourself a lucky human. You are a European billionaire in his 30s. After the recent death of your father, your mother died a long time ago. You inherited the family manor and company. You are also a single and handsome. Yes, you are lucky, you son of a bitch. As a libertine, you... What is a libertine? What does that mean? You have indulged in many vices. Those we can't mention because of censorship. You have never harmed anyone against your will, though. But all these wild experiences couldn't slake your thirst. Ah, uh, like the Great Gatsby or whatever. You want to taste what was not tasted before. Conquer the unconquered. Nowadays, you have a new interest. Historical artifact. Prehistoric vases. No, you don't like those boring things. You own Alexander the Great Sword, which he used for cutting the Gordian Knot. You didn't obtain it in legal ways, but that doesn't matter to you, and you seek more. It's a summer night, your smartwatch shows 1.11 a.m. Your six servants are sleeping in their rooms, that's the way you like it. If you don't like being disturbed by their presence at night, you want to be alone at this hour. While enjoying some malt whiskey, you are in front of your laptop in your study room checking social media. Yes, even billionaires do it. With a small glass of whiskey, whiskey and Cuban scars, you remember that you haven't checked your emails for a while. There are six unread emails. Four of them are business emails. One of them is from your friend Bill, another rich man. You love this. It is the subject of the mail. This last one is from Bill, an eight. Oh, this last one is from Bill, an ancient, an artifact smuggler. Crystal skull, he says on the subject. Read my friend's email. The mail consists of a single image. It belongs to a creepy clown with sharp teeth and a hideous smile on his white face. Low key lighting and the blood that spills from his mouth makes it even even more disturbing. You have a phobia of clown, and Phil knows it very well. Fuck you, bitch. There are five unread emails last. What's do my business email say? These mails are more from your employees. They inform you that the painkiller medicine that your enterprise produces won't can't be sold in Sweden anymore. You are too drunk to handle this situation right now. This medicine ban is not such an important loss for your enterprise anyways. 
You produce and export many other products. I have to show you this, Bill says. The skull is made of pure crystal and nobody knows where it's from. You won't believe its story. He has taken a photo of the skull from with his phone. The fluorescent light when his room is weak, but somehow the skull is very clear. It's clearly visible in the photo. Despite the quality of the photo, the skull looks amazing with this shiny material. You have seen enough crystal jewelry to know that Bill isn't showing something fake here. Let me bring it to your place. What will be your response? I am not interested. Bill, go to sleep. You take a final sip from your drink, turn your laptop off, and head to your bedroom. Fall asleep. You wake up to a new day. The first thing you do every morning is check checking Facebook and mails on your phone. On Facebook, the first posts you see are about the suicide of Phil, your friend. He died last night. It shocks you because he has always been a happy man who loved to prank his friends. He was as rich as you. There were no reasons he'd commit suicide, yet he jumped off the third floor of the mansion. There's some unread emails. One of them is titled about Phil, sent by Bill the Smuggler. I know it was strange, but I was at Phil's place before he committed suicide. I sold him the crystal skull and left the mansion. When I learned that he died, and nobody knows about this skull, I think of one, one of the servants took and hid it. After reading the email, you feel somehow relieved. Maybe you saved yourself from disaster. The end. The game has four endings. That was a happy ending. Alright. Bring it to the mansion. Bring it to the mansion! So you turn off your computer and start waiting for Bill. Fifteen minutes later, your phone rings. The melody is Amado Mio by Pink Martini. It shows Bill as a caller. Answer the call. Hello? You pick up your phone and answer the call. Hey, it's me, dude. And then all rich people talk like this. Bill says on the phone, looking out the window, you see him standing in the door. I don't want to wake our, your people up. Open the door for me, will you? You leave your study. Descend the stairs, your study room is at the third floor of the mansion, and open the huge wooden door of the mansion. Bill smiles at you. It is nice to see you again. I am sure you'll love what I've got here. He shows you full khaki sports bag. Let's move on to the study. Let's move on to the study room. You climb up the stairs in your study room as Bill follows you. After you reach there, Bill closes the door of the study room and pulls the artifact from his bag. Bill puts the crystal skull on your desk with a confident smile on his face. Oh God, you have seen many things in your life, but this skull is one of the prettiest one ever. The skull is made of pure crystal and all the details of the human skull is imprinted. It refracts the lights of the room with elegance. Bill is ready to answer your questions. How did you obtain it? I was afraid you'd ask that, but because you won't believe me. After a long pause, Bill continues. It was brought to me by a driver who dived into the seashore. He said that he started hearing voices inside his head when he saw it was in a sea. Find me, the voices told him. He swam to the direction of the voices and found a floating bag. It is strange you expect a skull like this should have been sunk. But it was floating, and the rest of the story is even stranger. Oh? After he found the bag with the skull, he continued hearing voices. They gave him, a, my, gave him my phone number. He told me they would never do any legal shit like that, like giving a historical artifact to a smuggler, but he couldn't disobey the voices. And you won't believe me, but when I touched the skull, I began seeing shit. Beautiful shit. The best shit! I saw myself fucking two hot bitches! Can you believe it, dude? I believe you in you. Well, thank you, I wouldn't believe me, let's be honest. You can touch it yourself, let's see if you see something. Oh, I'll touch it. You approach its skull and touch it with your bare hand, and then the vision starts. Oh, wait. You are something magnificent. Definitely not human anymore. Something way beyond human. A cosmic entity. You are omniscient. You can see and hear the whole universe. Nothing, no secrets are kept from you. You are inside the every mind that exists on Earth. Now you can see yourself in the form of a human. You are at the top of the hill under the sun. You are not alone. There are two millions of people around the hill. They are all naked and on their knees. They chant your name. You know they are yours. They say, jump, jump, and then I jump and I die. The vision ends. It feels like you hit the ground where you were when you were flying high in the heavens. You find yourself touching the skull and Bill is looking at you with a smile. I told you, he says. 
This skull is magical. Who crafted this and when? I have no idea. The skull is found in a bag in the sea. It resembles nothing I have ever sold or heard. I didn't even know that it was possible to craft a baby like this. Look at it. Isn't it wonderful? Oh, this is the skull and the bag that the king threw into the- That's what- Oh my god, that's really cool that they're linked like that. How much do you want? Oh, I only want a hundred million C's. Normally I would sell by auction, but really I don't want to keep this thing. I feel like I can lose it if I keep it more than a few hours. You gotta buy much more blind things for higher prices. That's enough, I want to buy it now! Bill smiles, great, make the money transfer and the skull is yours. Transfer the million billion C's. You open your computer once again. Of course you don't use banks for illegal stuff like that. Instead you open your Bitcoin account. With a few clicks, all the money is sent to the smuggler. It doesn't take long for phone's bills phone to beat. He looks up to his phone and smiles. It was a good deal, dude. He waves it. He waves at you while leaving the study room with his empty bag. If you want anything, you know whom to call. Soon you hear Bill's car leaving the mansion. Now you are alone in the study room with the skull. Touch the skull. If you touch the skull, something strange happens. All the lights in the room go off. The crystal skull starts to shine and emit. Emit white light illuminating the room. You hear a voice. Male or female, you can't figure it out in your mind. Greetings, mortal. You feel the skull gazes into your soul. I can hear you talk to me. Who are you? I've got many names. Sarah's soul is one. Some perceive me as an angel, some as a demon, some as a god. The truth is, there are forces in this universe inconceivable to the tiny human mind. I am one of those forces. For ages I have been worshipped by mankind and the entities unknown to your world, but I am forgotten. I am preparing my return. But God, I don't believe in you. Haha, I don't need your belief. You are rich, but still mortal. I have been worshipped millennia ago, before you were born. I will still exist after your death. Your lifespan is in my minute. In fact, I can kill you right now, like a worthless insect. Do you want to die? Go ahead and try to kill me. Suddenly you feel, oh wow. Suddenly you feel a tremendous agony in your whole body. It feels like a giant is stepping on you as if you were in a little insect. You are unable to breathe. You fall on the carpet with unbearable pain. You squirm, squirm and try to catch your breath, but it chokes you. For 15 seconds, that felt like an eternity. It releases you and you hear the words in your mind. I am the merciful God. Always for your questions. What are you? Wrong question. It's not who, not what. It's who, not what. I already asked that. Are you stuck in this crystal skull? I see and hear and know everything. My existence is far beyond this material skull. You know who I am? Yes, I know who you are, like I know everything else. You are a billionaire who is afraid of clowns and hasn't earned his fortune this hard work. You can want to taste all kinds of joys on this earth. I can give you what you want. It's not. It was not a coincidence that the diver and Bill brought me to you. Yes, I can give you what you want. But what will you give me? You're stuck in a cute mortal body. You can be a cosmic entity like me. You will know everything. Be ageless, mortal, and worshipped. I demand something first. What do you demand? Ancient civilizations have always offered me something valuable. They sacrificed human lives for me. I want you to kill someone interested. Innocent. I am interested. Okay, I know someone who you can kill. Nobody cares about the lives of prostitutes. You will find a young girl in the alleyway that you always buy something. You know what it is. Her name is Nina. She has short red hair and she is a virgin. This is going to be her first and last night she does her job. You will recognize her when, after you, when you see her. You don't need to hide anything after you sacrifice her to me, as you will be above the law of all humans. Deal. Deal? I know you possess Alexander's sword and keep it in the basement along with your wine bottles. I want you to go kill Nina with it. Go get your car. I am waiting. Go to your garage. As you leave your study room, descend the staircase and go to the garage Keep your expensive cars. 
You have a sports car with this distinctive red color and a black, another black car that looks like a vigilante with bat costume job. You can choose one of them to bring the prostitute to your mansion. Red car, duh. So you get in your red car and drive to the alley that you always find your thing we won't name here. Sex. Prostitutes? We already said prostitutes. Despite the high horsepower of your car, you drive slowly in order to examine the people of the alley. The alley is almost isolated. You see only a few people. You know that they don't sell legal things. And you see them they're so much of a girl. Ruby, with a very short skirt and long legs, she's clearly a prostitute. She smokes a cigarette, but she coughs with every breath she takes from it. As you approach her, you see that she has red hair like the crystal skull described. You know she's your car. Down the horn. She approaches your red car's window. She looks quite young and naive and cute, but you are here for something else. Um, excuse me, sir. She slyly talks to you. I believe that you seek some fun, don't you? What is this, amateur hour? Uh, okay, let me get it straight. Do you want to fuck me for 40 C's? Get in the car. She gets in the car and sits on the seat next to you, and you, as you start your car, she asks, Will you bring me back here after the job is done? I'm not that experienced, to be honest. We're on your own. Um, okay, I can call a cab, I guess. About to arrive at the mansion. There, your name is Nina. The girl is shocked. Oh, how do you know my name? Mr. Scott. Um, okay. The part of running an international company is reading minds and hearing the unsaid. She thinks that you are a fucking man yet, but she can't reject you. Why do you do this, John? My dad's in jail. He's in huge debt. It's the quickest way I can earn money to help him. Oh, well, you're screwed. So you finally arrive in your mansion. You stop this car and gets off and get off. As she gets off, she looks at your mansion with awe. Wow, it looks so pretty. It must be wonderful to live here. She follows you as you walk in the, to the mansion and open the door. The sword is in the basement. Let me show you something more interesting. You look like a man with surprises and mystery. I love it. I wonder how this night will end. Me too! <laughs> you open the door that leads to the basement stairs. You turn on the lights and descend. And the girl follows you. You walk past the wine cask. I'm sure... Turkey you that. You have good taste in wine, she says. You had hidden Alexander's sword between the two casks. Now you find... You pull it from the spot you hit it. You stand between her and the basement door so she can't escape from you. Wow, that sword looks so antique. Who used to own it? I guess I could not murder. Alexander the Great. Ah, is this the sword he cut the Gordian knot with? I know his story. He became the king. Because he thought outside the box he cut the nut. Cut the, cut the nut. He cut the, cut the knot instead of solving it by hand. I always wanted to be someone like great like him, but I ended up being a prostitute. You will be great after I sacrifice you. She is surprised as fuck <laughs> because of your serious manner. She understands that you are not joking. What? Are you going to kill me? She gets on her knees. Please don't kill me. Kill her. Oh! You repeatedly stab the sword into the prostitute's abdomen. Blood flows out of the slit on her abdomen. Her eyes are staring at the... You would disbelieve. She falls on the ground as you pull the sword. You understand that she died. Killing her gives you hardiness in your under underwear, as you are a sadist to accept the skull's offer without hesitation. You feel you are fainting, maybe because of the adrenaline of killing your girl, maybe something else, but you slowly lose your consciousness as the sword and your body, unconscious body fall on the floor. You wake up, you lie on the basement floor, but you are naked. Your skin has a white color, as white as snow. The sword is gone, and at the end of the basement, you see a chair. You never had chairs in the basement. Nina's sitting on it. She is facing facing back. You can't see her face. Ah, oh, go to Nina. Barefooted, you walk to the chair that Nina sits on. She doesn't move to react to your presence. Touch her shoulder. 
who turns her face to you. There's no flesh on her face, it is only a skull with red hair, but she can't still talk. You took my life! Her angry voice echoes in the basement. You can feel her gaze upon you, even though she doesn't have eyes. Leave the basement. That sounds like a good idea. You leave the basement. Something is wrong with the mansion. All the walls and floors have a rusty metal texture now. You hear a mixture of crying and laughing sounds, but you can't understand the source. Rusty walls aren't the only strange things. You see, all your six servants are at the entrance of the basement welcoming you. They are not human anymore, but mannequin with servants clothes. They stand motionless, but their heads are pointed at you. Go upstairs. You approach the staircase with the tension of going up. Go to the study room. You hear a loud fire behind you. Looking back, you see that the servants are now standing in a horizontal line at the bottom of the staircase. They somehow moved there while you weren't, while you didn't see them. They are staring at you motionless, blocking the way to the exit. As you find your way to the study room, you see rusty metal invading metals invading every part of your mansion. The ultra mansion doesn't cease to surprise you. You see your, a man yourself waiting for you in the study room. To be exact, someone who looks exactly like you with a black suit. He holds a sword in his hand. He smiles at you. Hello, my friend. You recognize the crystal call. Hello, my friend. You recognize the crystal skull's words. I think you like how I look like now, because I am you now. He waits for your questions. What have you done to my mansion? I altered it to my liking. I told you I had powers, but I needed to regain them by giving me a sacrifice. You gave me the power of manipulating reality. Once again, I should thank you for that, but I won't, because I don't need you anymore. What do you want? I was worshipped in old times, but modern people have forgotten me. I want my rights back. You are a fool with money. You had the potential to be the one of the people who rule the world. But you spent your monies on your mortal pleasures. I am going to use your inheritance the right way. You lied to me. Yes, I did. So what are you going to do about that? You feel so weak and vulnerable. You have no chance of... No chance against a man holding a sword should you try to attack him. What have you done to me? Oh, I altered you too. He points at the rusty metal wall. The curtain covers it. There's never was a curtain there before. Look, at, there's a mirror behind. Look at yourself. Open the curtain. You open the curtain and confront your reflection on the mirror. You are a fucking clown. <laughs> you have a big red nose. There may, is makeup around your mouth that forms the shape of a smile, but in reality, you're so far away from smiling. You're terrifying. It is permanent, he says as you break down and start crying. Oh, now if you'll allow me, he says, touching your white shoulder. I have places to go. He walks to the door with the sword in hand. While he was about to leave, you see Nina at the entrance of the study room. Her body is human, but her head is a skull with hair. Let me leave you alone with Nina, he says. After he leaves, Nina starts to walk at you stumbling as if one of her legs was crippled. You should have never bought that skull. Alright, that's the second ending. That one's a long one to have so many endings. Alright, one's gonna be the happy ending where I go with Nina. Oh, I did it on accident. I did the same one. Crap. You gotta be careful. Oh, back. We got three more stories to go. Well, actually, like two. I actually wasn't gonna do all the endings, but I'm actually kind of enjoying it. Even though it's kind of some of the grammar's kind of off a little bit, but it's so good. Like it's readable. Then I will kill you and find someone else who is not afraid to dirty his hand with blood. Uh, okay. I'm not afraid, I won't kill anybody. Oh, you fall on the floor, you try to stand up, but your whole body is paralyzed. And you stand up, but not voluntarily. Something controls your body, it walks to the window of your study room and opens a window. It climbs through it with horror. You look at the concrete floor 
10 meters away from the window pane you are on. It lets your body fall. You gain control of your body once again while you are in the air, but you can't do anything to prevent the fatal flaw. Newspaper will write about the will write that the rich billionaire has committed suicide. All right, that's the third ending. I know how to get the fourth ending too, so let's do that. I can give you what you want from 40C. Deal. He gets in your car and sits on next to you. Will you bring the Yeah, I will. Well, thank you, sir. She's not too bad. You're welcome. Why do you do this job? My dad is in jail. What is your name? Doesn't matter, all the names are the same. You can call me anything. But oh, let's please let it be a girl's name. Nina then. Ah, that's really my name. Don't say anything. Let me show you something more interesting. I wonder how this night- Me too! <laughs> oh, I was going to murder you, but I can't. You say, ah, oh, I was going to murder. Because you start- But you can't continue your words because you start to lose control of your body. You fall on the floor paralyzed. The sword falls with you as you can no longer hold it. Then you feel that some- Ah, oh, this is bullshit. You stand up and pick up the sword without your consent. You hold the sword so that the tip is on your belly. The position part here. Damn, save me, chick! I was going to kill you and I didn't. You stab the sword into your abdomen, abdomen and fall on your knees. The prostitute screams as you keep pulling and pushing the sword into your body until you fall on the floor. You gain control of your body once again, but it's too late. The stabs are too deep and there's nothing you can do but wait for death to come. It comes before she can get help. Well, that's all four endings then, that's four endings. There was no happy ending. Well, I guess if I didn't touch the skull at all, but I was hoping there'd be a happy ending with Nina. Whatever, it's fine, lame. All right, Madness in the Infinite Loop. You are doomed to live a depressing Monday, which keeps repeating itself with Groundhog Day. No matter what you do, you can't, you wake up to the same day, even if you commit suicide. Can you keep your morals and mental health when you do nothing? When nothing you do is permanent? Why are you stuck in this infinite loop? Play to find out. You wake up in your bed. You wish you were dead. In fact, you should have been dead. You committed suicide many times before, but no, there is no laughter life for you. Only the repeat of the same day. Not only do you hate your never any day, but you also yourself. You have an obligation to go to work. You hate your job and small cubicle in the cold office. Maybe you could do something crazy today and spend the day at home or kill yourself. You are in the bedroom. It is a rainy morning. There's a wooden table near your bed. On the table, there's an alarm clock within a picture of your ex-wife. There's a drawer beneath the table. Open the drawer. You open the drawer. There's only one important item in there. Your nine millimeter, nine millimeter pistol it has a capacity of 17 rounds. Pick it up. I can just shoot myself. Awesome. Go to the bathroom. You're in the bathroom. Looking at the mirror, you can see that you need to shave. Your beard has grown a few millimeters, bad enough for your work. If you wish, you can scar your face with the razor or cut your wrist because you can wake up with the intense of self hate each morning. I'll shave my beard. You shave your beard. You hate how you look like when you don't have facial hair. Even your mother says that you look like an egg this way. Uh, let's go to the living room. I like all the kill yourself options. You're on the living room now. There are your old television and worn sofa in front of it. You disperse your suit in the so Your dispersed suit is on the sofa. You can either go to work or spend the day, whole day watching television. You'll probably get fired if you choose it. Hmm. Go to work. You wear your suit and head off to work. It's a rainy day, but you have lost your umbrella. You get wet till you reach to the subway station. It takes about 15 minutes to reach there. Carry your gun 
tear your gun at the back of your trousers. It is hidden by your jacket. While descending the stairway, the stairs to the subway station, you pass by two teenagers smoking cigarettes. They are at most 13 years old. You overhear one of them say this. I watch TV to remember. You never wanted to have kids. They would probably be like, te like those teenagers who began smoking at this early age. You took a sterilization operation a few years ago, but your wife didn't know any know about it. Dang, you had a wife and you did that? I could kill everyone, and I'd rather not. You are in the subway station, nobody notices you. As you haven't done anything interesting like cutting, cutting your face. Wait for the train to come. After waiting 10 minutes, you see the approaching light on the... There's gotta be a ton of endings on this one. Get on the subway. The train stops. You get in it with the crowd commuters and it departs. After 15 minutes, you arrive at the ugly gray skyscraper that you call office building. At the end of the, your office, at the 13th floor of the skyscraper, you see your boss. He is the man you hate most, an overweight, bald man with a black mustache. You always wanted to murder him, but you always controlled your anger somehow. Because once you react in anger, you lose your control of yourself. He stares at you. Get in my cubicle. You get in front of your old computer. The morning monitor has a big tube that you hate. You stare, start working on your shitty duties. You do repetitive things like those should have been done by an automatic system. Your only break is looking at the social media. It is actually forbidden in the office, but you found a back door. You see a picture of, your fr of a friend of yours at the beach. She is with your ex-wife and her new boyfriend. Wow. You had actually blocked your ex-wife and her boyfriend so that you wouldn't see them once again, but it doesn't work if there's another shown in another person's photo. The couple looks so happy together. She looks happier this time than she was. How she was with you. Nothing interesting happens during the rest of the day. You feel quite sleepy. You don't wouldn't you won't need sleeping pills now. Maybe you could reach redemption, but you don't even remember what you have done. Maybe you should remember it first. You fall asleep, press any key to continue. You wake up in your bed. You wish you were dead. In fact, you should have been dead. Okay, this is the same. Look at the picture. The photograph shows that you're with your ex-wife at the beach. When you were on your honeymoon, she has long black hair, brown eyes, and a pretty face. She was the prettiest woman for you when you were together. You both look so happy in this frame with serious smiles, but that but it was the past. You feel a terrible guilt looking at this picture. Look out the window. Look at the long clock. The digital alarm clock shows 7 a.m. Monday with its green LCD lights. It's the exact same thing you wake up each repeating morning, and it is always Monday whenever you wake up. Look out the window. You are at the 15th, 13th and top floor of the apartment building. The sky is covered with clary clouds. This grayness is reflected upon everything you see. People are walking in a hurry. Some of them don't have umbrellas on this rainy morning. There are no green trees, only high concrete structures. There isn't any trace of happiness out there. Go to the bathroom. Go to the living room. Spend the day watching TV. You turn on your old TV and television and sit on the sofa in front of it. First channel you see airs the news. The news are about a war going on a distant part of the planet. You see bombed homes and dead children under the debris. Immigrants are trying to flee on overcrowded boats. Turn to the next channel. Second channel, there is a beauty contest, but for little kids. You see kids with makeups. Their painted faces disgust you. The jury consists of older men. The third channel airs an advertisement about a new antidepressant. It shows women running with happiness in a field of grass and flowers, but you notice the grass and flowers are plastic. Now you see something you never expect on the television. It's a man in a suit, but his head is a goat skull. The man or demon with goat skull gazes into your soul. He asks you, you are stuck in an infinite loop. Do you remember why this is happening to you? No. Let me show you then, you won't like it. The television shows your ex-wife's face. She is crying with despair. Nine millimeter pistol gets in the frame. It's pointed at her head. Oh, the trigger is pulled and she's dead. I hate those noises. So I killed her. The camera now shows the man who pulled the trigger, you. 
You see yourself crying like a baby. You killed her, but you loved her. You still loved her. Television fades away. What will you do? Do yourself cut. I'm gonna take sleeping pills and go to sleep. Sleeping pills have been your best friend. They make you sleep instantly. You could like them more if they hadn't made you wake up a different day, though. You take different, two different sleeping pills and go to sleep. Day watching TV. Guess I gotta kill myself. Oh, I should hit yes. God dang it. And pull the trigger. Okay, well, we're back here. There's gotta be a way to get past the loop. Uh, go to the bathroom, shave my beard, go to the living room, spend the day watching TV. Yes. Then let me remind you something. You can actually redeem yourself, but you have to find it out how. Hmm. You pick up Razor and start cutting your face with self-hatred. Blood drips out of each scar. At the end of a five minute masochist action, you leave your face with so many scars that your face looks red. You are in the bathroom. At, you wish you can scar your face with the razor or cut your... Oh, let's do this. Go to work. You wear your suit and head off to work. You get wet and then whatever. While descending the stairs to the subway station, you pass by teenagers. They are almost 13 years old. The kids are afraid of you because of what you did to your face. You never wanted to have kids. People in the subway station look at you with horror and surprise. Probably they have never seen someone who cut his face this way. They can't, you can't expect people to react normally to what you have done. After waiting for 10 minutes, you see the approaching lights on the subway tunnel. Get on the subway. After the train stops, you get in it with the crowd of commuters as it departs. After 15 minutes, you arrive at the ugly skyscraper that you call office building. At the entrance of your office at the 13th floor of the skyscraper you see your boss he is the man you hate you always wanted to murder him bah, he stares at you as you are about to walk to your cubicle your boss stops you what the fuck have you done to your face i knew you were a sick fuck but this is too much fuck off i won't don't want you in my office anymore you're fired you don't have any personal belongings in your office so you go straight home nothing interesting happens until you reach home you're at home now what will you do Spend the day watching TV. You turn on your old TV television and sit on the sofa in front of it. This is hard. Soon you start losing consciousness. I think I know what I have to do. Uh, maybe. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I think I'm gonna shoot the boss, so. Maybe I have to shoot everybody. You pull your gun to uh, your disgusting boss. He looks at you and your gun is complete. You shoot your boss at the head and he falls on the floor. Of course they arrest you for doing that. They put you in custody in the police station you're on a cold concrete stair. At the evening, a police officer comes to your cell. You have a you have a visitor, he says. A woman with long red coat approaches the bar, but the most interesting part is her wearing a Venus mask on her face. The face is not visible, but you recognize the woman by her body and black hair. She is your ex-wife. Turns to the policeman. Leave me alone with him. He orders the man. He leaves the room. You are alone with your ex-wife. 
I am sure that you are surprised to see me once again, she says. And I am surprised about one thing too. You have finally done something that you wish to do. It's your only success in life. Your only success in life is to take a life. She takes off her mask. There is no face under the mask. It is a skull remained from a rotten body. Now her voice echoes in the concrete still. You are a murderer. No matter what you say, no matter what you do, you can't change what happened. You wake up in your bed. You wish you were dead. In fact, wait, it's that I can redeem myself. I, what the? F uh. Shave my beard. I guess I'm gonna try shooting everybody. I don't think that's the right answer, but kill everyone. Nothing is moved. People look at your horror and time freezes, and your phone rings. That was terrifying. Yes, despite you being in a subway station, the caller name is Dominus, but you never had someone with that name on your phone. Answer the call. The person who calls you starts speaking about it before you could say hello to him. You know who I am. Yes. It is good you finally know me, for you are stuck with me forever. Then he hangs up. Time turns back to normal, but this time everybody you wanted to kill forms a circle around you and starts walking at you. Your gun now functions, you can't shoot anymore. Damn. You feel your pulse beat awake, weakening. You are blanking out as the people approach you. You fall on the ground unconsciously. Okay. Open the drawer. Pick up the pistol. There's so much shit going on here, dude. This is a rough one. Now, I'm your capture and punisher. This is exactly why you must be punished. How does one make up for what they did in this game? Because I've tried like all the options. Jump on the rails. You walk beyond the yellow lines that forbid you getting near the rails. As the crowd watches you, you jump down the rail. You lay on the rails motionless. The Train approaches you, the crowd shouts and signals the machinists to stop, but apparently the machinist doesn't notice them. Or maybe there aren't any machinists on the, in the train. Either way, the train runs over your body. That becomes the last thing you felt, at least for the day. What if I pick up the pistol, shave my beard, go to the living room, watch the TV, Wait for the train to come. Get on the subway. Go to your cubicle. Maybe I just gotta live a normal day. Oh, you fall asleep and find yourself in a dream. You never had any dreams during the time you got stuck in the loop. In this dream, you find yourself at the entrance of your apartment with your suit on. It is nighttime. Apparently, you have just arrived from a tiring day at work. No lights are turned on in the kitchen. But candle lights are coming from your kitchen. Just because I took a gun on the first day, I didn't get the good ending? Are you kidding me? What if I wanted protection? And you hear the voice of your wife coming from the candlelit kitchen. Honey, welcome. Go to the kitchen. She is standing in the kitchen with a pretty smile on her face. She is wearing a red dress. Two candles are lit on the kitchen desk. Two dishes of spaghetti bog knees. A bottle of wine are also on the desk. You are surprised because you had never seen her this alive since the infinite loop began, which is why you were able to say nothing. She holds your hands. I have great news to tell you. What is it, honey? I'm pregnant. I'm pregnant. You remember that you had sterilization oper oh, operation before without letting your wife know it. A tantrum is about to overwhelm you. The situation makes you unable to say anything. What if the sterilization didn't work? Try to get calm. You sit on the chair, trembling with anger. Darling, what is wrong? She puts her palm on your face. Explain the operation. He listens as you carefully, you carefully as you explain her how you got an operation that makes you unable to become a father. She defends herself. But I swear, you are the only man. I don't know. How about you see the doctor once again? Can't there be a mistake in the operation? There could be. 
Something that you don't expect starts happening. You start feeling that you are waking up from the dream, but you aren't in your bed now. You are in the kitchen, but as an entity without a body. It is impossible to say at which point you are in a three-dimensional space. Your presence covers all the kitchen. And you see everything. You see the lying body of two dead people, your wife and yourself. The gun is in your hand, pointing at your head. You feel the presence of a second entity, but it is not your wife. It is a demon or angel that kept you in this loop. You hear his voice. You know what? She is right. She never cheated on you. The operation wasn't successful. I knew it. You are at the end of the road. That goes down to redemption. The loop is broken. Now follow me. I will show you where souls go. The end. That only has one end, but it took forever to get to it. <laughs> that was really well made, to be honest with you. That one was really, really well made. You are a single father. Your wife, Linda, passed away while giving... Because if, even if you take the gun, it screws the whole thing up where you don't get the good ending. So it makes you, oh my god, it was really good. That was good. While giving birth to your son a year ago, you will be able to use a Ouija board in contact with, not a Ouija board. <laughs> that's a uh, uh, John Wick meme. Matt, Matt, that's good, Matt meme. With an entity who claims to be a Linda in this story. Oh, do I actually have to Ouija board? Press any key to continue. New Jersey, 1981. You are a single father. Your wife, Linda, passed away with a year ago, a year ago with childbirth. Your son's name is Mark. He is a cute baby with blue eyes that he got from his mother. As expected, you are in agony of the loss of your wife. Mark is the only thing that you hold on to. All that matters. It's like that one story I played. Now, you have been in love with Linda since the first time you saw her. She was so pretty. You wanted to be with her forever. Still surprises you. You have to... You to have such a charming woman to fall in love with you too. During Linda's pregnancy, you lost your job. At some point, while having debts, she supported you in every way she could. Not only was she your wife, but also your best friend. You found another job after Mark was born and Linda died. But of course, it doesn't make you a happy man when you, lo you have lost your best friend and wife. You gotta be strong for Mark, man. Looking in Mark's blue eyes gives you all the strength to go on as a single father. See the future in his eyes, in the past, the past with when you were happy with your family, despite of everything falling apart. You would lose everything if you lost Mark. Another reason what made Linda and Mark so significant is you had lost your parents too. Basically, you have no family members left except for your son. Nobody to consult for things that you need to talk with a family member. Linda's parents? You don't have to see those assholes anymore, and they have done wrong to you and Linda. It is a foggy morning. You are talking. You are taking a walk in an isolated green forest, which is close to a suburb you live. You can't see anything but the fog beyond five meters. There is a single path, and you are walking it. You know that the path leads to a lake. You have been there countless times. There is nobody else you can see here in this forest. But somehow. You feel that something awaits for you at the end of the path. Walk along the path. You reach a lake and you encounter a woman who looks uncannily familiar standing at the side of the lake. She's turning her back to you. You can see, you see that she has long blonde hair and a black dress so familiar. She slowly turns back and faces you with a smile on her face. She is nobody but Linda, completely alive. Did you miss me, darling? I miss you so much. I long to be with you two again. There is a way. I'd rather not. You hold your hands. Buy a Luigi board. I will talk to you through that. You know what a Ouija, a Ouija board. Pronounce Ouija or Ouija. Wow, Luigi <laughs> board is. It is just a board with letters and numbers on it. And you use it to talk to spirits. A strong wind starts blowing. In the blink of an eye, her flesh turns to ashes. Well, see, that's... The harsh wind carries the back of the black ashes away, leaving a grim skeleton standing with you. You find yourself holding the hands of a skeleton who looks into your very soul with carved eyes on the skull. You wake up. It was a dream, a repeating one. You keep having this dream every night. It started a few days ago. It's a Monday morning now, and you are in your bedroom. It's a winter, but it's winter, but still sunny. After getting off the bed, you take a look at yourself in the mirror hanged on the wall. You look worn out. Check on Mark. Your house has two stories. The 
Bedrooms are at the upper one. You walk into be Mark's bedroom, which is next to yours, trying not to make a sound. You slowly open the wooden door of the bedroom. Your son sleeps peacefully in his cradle. You would expect a one-year-old boy to make noises all the time, but, not, but Mark is not such a boy. He rarely cried. He has been a happy boy. Bedroom's walls are painted in a calming tone of blue. A circle of toys are hanging up the cred on the cradle. Two figures, uh, a lion, sun, red cat, moon are the parts of this installment. There is a big poster of a yellow baby bird on the wall. Change Mark's diapers like you always do in the morning. You can complete changing the diapers. The doorbell rings. It's probably the caretaker, Isabella. She comes every morning at this hour. Open the door. You go downstairs and open the door. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir, says Isabella. She's a woman in her 20s with curly black hair and brown eyes. She steps into your house. Your daily routines start with making breakfast while Isabella takes care of Mark. You go to the work after the breakfast, unless it's a weekend. Isabella walks into the kitchen, opens the fridge, and picks up the formulated milk for babies without mothers. Talk about the dreams. Before Isabella leaves the kitchen, you tell her everything you've seen in those recurring dreams and how Linda asked you to use the Ouija board to communicate with her. It's easy to see how surprised Isabella is. Sir, don't do that. It's too dangerous. You shouldn't mess with the dead. Isabella climbs up the stairs to take care of Mark. You are hungry. You need to make breakfast. You like listening to music on the radio. I love breakfast. Will you turn on the radio today? Uh, yeah, I like the radio. You turn on the radio. It's the playing song is Sunny from Boney M. Sunny yesterday, my life was filled with rain. <laughs> I don't know. Sunny, you smiled at me and eased the, really eased the pain. The dark days are gone and the bright days are here. My sunny one shines so sincere. Sunny one, so true, I love you. You like that song. It kind of reminds you of happy times you had with Linda. You make yourself an omelet. I wonder if that's a real song. Yourself an omelet and a cup of coffee. That's your daily routine. After you finish the breakfast, it's time to leave the house. Will you buy a Ouija board? You can get one at the toy store to buy it before we're going to work, or you can refuse to buy it, thus refusing to contact, contact with what you see in your dreams. Don't buy it. So you say goodbye to Isabella and go to work without buying the Ouija board. Nothing interesting happens but for the rest of the day. Your usual depressing, boring life continues. You no longer see Linda in your dreams. Did she give up on you? Or what trespassed your dreams or something but your wife's lovely soul? You'll never know. Maybe it's the best. It's always the best. The story has three endings. Okay, let's do it again. Walk on the path. All that we see are... What is that? Inception? Despite it being a winter day, it's not cold outside. There is a toy store you know. There, this is where you buy Mark's toys. You remember seeing a Ouija board there. It doesn't take long to reach the store. You enter the store and start searching for the board upon all those call for toys. You find a box that looks quite different from the toys. It doesn't look cute. Not something you'd buy for your kid. It's a grim looking Ouija board. You pick up the box from of the Ouija board and move to the cash point. The cashier is a brunette young woman. She gets surprised to see the box. Ah, you want to buy that? What will you use it for if you don't mind asking? You see my deceased wife in my dreams. I have to warn you, in my religion, dead doesn't talk with this. There are things that claim they are souls of humans, but the truth they are not. They are evil. Do not buy this board. I'm still buy it. Okay, as you wish, but if you are going to use it, don't use it by yourself. Never ask when or how someone will die. So you pay the board's price and buy it. You put it in a plastic bag with the logo of the store, toy store and go to your office. As an accountant, you think that you have a dull job. Nothing interesting happens during the work. You have no friends to talk to. After the shift's end, you are ready to go home. Darkness has fallen. Knowing Isabel is at home, you ring the door, the bell when you arrive. Welcome, she says with a smile after opening the door. Her shift ends when you're coming home. She got ready to head off. Mark is sleeping peacefully. He has just started sleeping. Isabella says before leaving the house, you can ask for her assistance in the seance. Yeah, join me. 
Sorry, I can't do that. You mustn't either. Isabella leaves. You're alone with Mark now. Come on, Mark. We're going to Ouija together, son. We're starting the seance. You climb the stairs and check on Mark. He looks so happy and peaceful while sleeping. Close the door and descend down the stairs. You will use the board in your living room. There is a table you can use there. You heard that it's best to turn the lights off before talking to the Ouija board. So you get a candle from the kitchen and light it. Then you turn off the lamps. So the only thing that enlightens the room is the candle. You pull the wooden board from its box and place it on the table. Then you get the planchette. The wooden part which you will put your finger on. The summon entity is supposed to move the planchette when your finger's on it. Are you ready? I'm ready. Linda, Linda, Linda! your finger on the push eddy. Oh, I get to do it. Cool. What if I take it off? Oh, I gotta keep my finger on it? Okay. H. A. Her. Here. Ah. Uh, here's Linda. Are you really Linda? Nope. That's a lie. Lie detector trying to determine that is a fucking lie. Will I bring Mark up well? No! That thing's a damn dick. M Linda wouldn't say that to me. Are you watching us from there? What kind of Linda are you? Why would you say I wouldn't bring Mark up well, you fucking dick? What do you want to tell me? Are... B N Ribbon. You need to start speaking some English. R B N R B N W D Y R B N W Z Y R G I R B N W Z R Y. Why did you return? No? Moon? What does that mean? I'm so confused. This Ouija board's messing me up. What does the moon mean? It fucked. <laughs> oh, I thought I was about to say it. You. Go. Go. We. We. Uh, that mean? We as a... We as! We as him! We as o. That's like, uh, what's that thing called from the Ouija board movie? Bozo or Bonozo or something? Zobo! What do you want from me? Here's your question. Oh, I already asked that, I guess. Cause I've already seen that. Okay, it wants the moon, apparently. We ain't got no moon. Next page. Did I move on to my life and meet a new woman? No. <laughs> well then. Why did you leave us? Yes? Oh. He... Die? I mean, yeah, I guess. Did? Yes, you did. Did not. We skipped a the letter there. Are you peaceful? No. Well, that's all I need to know. Put this thing back. Why are you restless? That's a good question. This is creepy. I don't really like this, to be honest with you. Moon. This thing's got some kind of fascination with that damn moon, son. Next page. When do we get married? Oh, it knows. Psychic. So it knows all the Linda things, but it's a dick. When will we be together? When I die, probably. Now? No. 
Never. Well, that's real fucked up, Ouija thing. Not really. Okay. Why am I playing this shit then? Oh, don't ask to that. Goodbye. So you're in the seance. This plasciate stops moving. You can't, can't even get any answers. Does it even lend a spirit? You can't be sure. Spirit doesn't show any physical activity after the seance in your house, but the mirrors. You feel something gazing upon you whenever you look in the mirrors in the bedroom and bathroom. You feel the presence watches you through the mirrors, and this presence is not benevolent. But you are not the only one feeling it. Mark cries whenever, always cries whenever you bring him near a mirror. You, you get scared by something he sees in the mirror. You had to remove the mirror from your bedroom in order to be able to sleep. Apparently buying the Ouija board wasn't a good idea. It o was open to doorway for entities, but honestly this isn't, this is not a problem. An exorcist can't solve. There are far worse things that can happen between you and Mark. Okay, so we got two of the endings now. There's one left. And that's where I asked. Never ask when someone's going to die. Okay. Yeah, I guess I'm ready. I'll just skip everything else. All the other shit seems like bonus crap. Die. I don't think I'm Me? Well, that's no good. Murder? Murder. Well, that's no good. Oh, I'm gonna die. Oh, I'm gonna kill Mark and kill myself. Well, we know how this game ends now. <laughs> the bad ending. There weren't many very happy endings. All the happy endings, you basically just don't mess with the shit. When will I die? Five minutes. Five years? Well, that's a good amount of time, at least. I still don't know why it wants the fucking moon, though. Well, I got five years. How long does Mark have? Ten years? The uh, night? The day? Oh. I guess I killed myself in prison after killing Mark. That's fucked up. Well then. Who would kill Mark? You, obviously. Me? False? That's fake news. Not if I got anything to do with the book. Why will you kill Mark? Yeah, that's a good question. The moon? What does- oh my god. This thing just blaming the sh everything on the moon, dog. Everything. <laughs> Bye. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. It's going wacky wavy. Ouija. And the planchette throws itself. It flies into the window of the living room, breaking it. You hear the radio in the kitchen started to play. Something turned it on. It plays a sinister voice that laughs. Laughter of a clown. It doesn't stop you. It feels like it's mocking you. Check on Mark. As you climb up the stairs, you can hear Mark crying in his room. That's certainly not good. Open the door. You frantically try to open the door to Mark's room. It's locked. Break the door. The door is not broken yet. You hear a muffled scream from Mark. Kick the door. Kick the door. Get the fuck out of the door. The scream stops. The door is broken. You rush... His pillow covers his face, as apparently he was choked. Mark shows no sign of life, he is dead. You cry in despair, you were warned not to use the Ouija board. Now you are alone with your remorse. Then you call 911. No one believes that Mark was killed by a supernatural entity. All the proofs show that Mark was killed by his father. You get arrested. 
Time flies fast and nothing gets better. You get sentenced to life for killing your son. You'll spend the rest of your life alone in just a cell. And that's how your psychological problems start. You find yourself thinking about morbid, morbid matters like the rotten corpses of Linda and Mark, or what Mark has seen when I have choked him to death, or how the Guardians would react if they find you have hung yourself. Sometimes you start laughing hysterically, but there's nothing funny to laugh at. Sometimes you throw wild tantrums, screaming with anger between the four walls of yourself. Are you going mad or is it taking you over? There's no difference, honestly. In the fifth year of your imprisonment, you decide to enter in the dire suffering and you succeed. The end. We got all three endings. We got all the endings. Credits. Interactive horror stories are written and coded by Ahmed Kamil Kalis. Special thanks to Esgi Satan Satan for proofreading. Oh, well, that was good. I enjoyed that. Well, guys, if you like videos like these, please like and subscribe. And this game was pretty good. Like, some of the stories were better than other, others. Like, I think the Madness Info Loop or the Doll was probably my favorite. The other ones were like, they're all right. Not, uh, none of them were like groundbreaking or like super original, but they were all pretty, all pretty like, a little bit above average. But thanks for watching as always, guys. I think I already said the please like and subscribe thing if you would like to, but bye.